Again, a warm welcome to all of you, a special welcome to our mothers and folks who are like mothers to us today. It's a beautiful morning to be together as we continue in this sermon series, Simon Peter, Flawed but Faithful Disciple. And so over these last weeks, uh, we've been spending some time with who is Simon, who is Simon Peter. And two weeks ago, we explored the call of Simon. Remember, he was a fisherman along with his brother Andrew. They had had a relationship with Jesus as they had had an encounter with John the Baptist. But you'll remember Jesus came and invited them to cast nets in a new place after a long night, and their lives were forever changed. And then last week, we talked about Jesus coming to the disciples over the troubled waters of the Sea of Galilee, or also known as Lake Gennesaret. And you'll remember that they thought Jesus was a ghost. Remember, they were frightened, but Jesus said, it is I, it is I. And then he, he invited Peter to step out at Peter's request, and Peter did. Though he began to sink, that arm wheat reached in and grabbed him up and pulled him out of the chaos of that storm. Today, we encounter Jesus and Peter and the disciples in another place. And today is a profound uh, story about how Peter suddenly begins to realize who Jesus is beyond who he thought he was. Amen? And so today we're going to hear how Jesus uh, hears Peter make an amazing proclamation about who he is, but then as Peter begins to realize the gravity of this reality, he can't take it in. It's too hard. And so he begins to try to push back, and Jesus responds rather sternly. It's one of the most stern responses Jesus has for a disciple. So let's pray together before we enter into this study together. Holy God, we thank you for this good and beautiful day. We thank you for your presence and love for us, and we thank you for Mother's Day and all the people here today who are mothers and like mothers to us, and people that are in other places and people we remember today. We're grateful for this beautiful day. We pray now, God, that in the busyness of our lives and the demands of our lives that we would make room for you to do whatever you want in our lives, that we would submit and surrender our very selves to you as we hear the word today to be forever changed, that the word today would speak deeply into our lives and forever change us and encourage us and renew our walk with Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. So I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase location, 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 right? That location's about everything. When I moved here um, seven plus years ago and I was looking for a place to live, I talked to lots of different people and lots of different apartment renters and all that kind of stuff. And everybody said, you want to live north of Lake Cook, right? And I said, really? Why? I don't know. And I did, and the rent was a lot higher, and then I realized it was about location in schools. Amen, right? You know, I should have paid attention to that. I don't have children. Who cares, right? You know, but anyway, here we go, right? Um, the deal is also um, location, location in the sense of where you locate a business, right? Uh, so when people are trying to figure out where they're going to put a restaurant or put a, a, a business or a retail shop or whatever, uh, the location is important. You remember when I grew up in the ancient ages, the shopping mall was the place to be, right? Now that's not it anymore, right? They're tearing stores down and rebuilding because location is different. Or you probably know sometimes there's a restaurant, a location for a restaurant. There are a few of these in Buffalo Grove. Some, they just can't ever make it there, right? So one goes in and you kind of get used to it. It's gone and another one goes in and you know what I'm saying? So I don't know if I have all this location stuff figured out, but location has a lot to do with things, right? And also, location or place has value, right? It has some sort of value to us. Uh, it's nice to be near a school so our kids can walk or to be close to shopping so we can go there, but sometimes location or place has sentimental value, right? So when I go home and, and I go near where my grandparents' house was, I remember things about them, and it's an important place to me. Or maybe you have a dear place you go, or a place of refuge. Like when I go to the botanical gardens, it's like a whole glimpse of heaven, amen? I mean, it's just a break for me to pray and to walk and to be deeply connected with God. And, and maybe you have that. Maybe your home church, or the place where you were married, or maybe the place where uh, your husband proposed to you, or where you had your engagement party. I, you know, and, 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 and even now, I, I find it interesting, when I was in high school, the prom was a sort of big deal, but not a huge deal, but now, it's not so much the prom, it's the invitation to the prom, right? And how it happens, and where it happens, and, 
you know, is it going to be in this place with this kind of act? You know what I'm saying? It's a huge ordeal. I'm thinking about leaving ministry and becoming a prom invitation coordinator, right? right? Maybe that'll pay for the roof. Amen. Right. Okay. <laughs> location, location. So the deal is, as we enter this story that you heard read so beautifully today, we really can't get into the story till we understand the location. And it's just a brief word. Now, when Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples. And we see that as just, okay, Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi, big deal. But the reality is, it is a big deal. So let's talk about Caesarea Philippi. I'm sure you've all done your reading and are well aware of Caesarea Philippi, but I'm going to help you out here, okay? Caesarea Philippi is about 25 miles north of the opening mouth of the Jordan as it goes into the Sea of Galilee, or what we also know as Lake Gennesaret. It's at the foothills of Mount Hermon, which is mentioned in Scripture, and it's where the water, the headwaters of the Jordan River come both from a spring below the mountain and from the snow melt off of a waterfall. It's a very beautiful place, actually, and for that area, which is kind of arid and below sea level in some ways, this place near Mount Hermon is stunning. And if you saw some of the pictures or if you want to Google it later, if the sermon's really boring, you want to Google now, uh, you'll get a sense that it, for that area, it's a really beautiful place. And today, it's a, state, it's a national reserve. It's a beautiful space with Herman Stream, which is the river. Now, what was interesting about this place was because it was so beautiful that the Greeks believed that that was a place to worship Pan or Pan, who you may remember from your Greek mythology was a guy with a an amazingly built torso, but then had a goat for a bottom, you know what I'm saying? So, kind of an odd creature, used to scare me a lot, right? And uh, so he was the god of creation, uh, fields, flocks, and so the Greeks worshipped him for kind of the gift of, of, of creation and beauty, right? And so here, the Greeks established a place of worship near this spring, and in fact, today, the, one of the names of the place still reflects uh, that Greek mythology of Pan being present there uh, as a place of worship. So, so there's this place of worship connected to the Greeks. And then when the Romans came along, um, uh, King Herod, you remember him, King Herod who was over that old area, including the place where Jesus grew up, he built a temple to honor uh, Caesar Augustus, the emperor. And he built that temple because Caesar gave him some additional territory for political coverage, and so to honor him, he built this huge temple uh, near this other space, and it was a place to worship Caesar Augustus. Because you remember, I know you know your Roman uh, politics and theology, but uh, people believed that once the emperor was named, he was like God, sometimes even called the son of God, and, and in fact, it, when Caesar Augustus died, he was deified, he was made a god, okay? So this temple is built by Herod as an act of praise. Later, Herod's son Philip came back to that area, and he decided to build a city, okay? And he named the city after Caesar, all right? And again, another tribute to the emperor, and so Caesarea. But there was a Caesarea on the Mediterranean uh, coast, because, you know, if you want to impress the Caesar, you build a city and name it after him, right? right? So um, Philip realized people were going to get confused, so it was called Caesarea Philippi, the city of Caesar built by Philip. Yeah, pretty creative, right? Okay, so anyway. So here we are, Caesarea Philippi. Think about what's going on here. This is a long place of pagan worship. It's a long place of emperor acknowledgement and worship. It's a place of political uh, acknowledgement of the empire's power. And it is this city, a Roman installation just north of Galilee. It's in a beautiful kind of rocky mountain place. Now there along with the spring, is a sheer 70-foot wall of rock. It's like a huge rock escarpment, okay? And all of that is present in this space, in this location for what happens today. Now, Jesus and his disciples are further south in Capernaum and around the Sea of Galilee. Remember where all this ministry has been taking place. And Jesus suddenly says to the disciples, let's go to Caesarea Philippi. Now, we don't think much about that, but it'd be like, let's go to Terre Haute, you know, and we all go, why? Who goes to Terre Haute, right? You know what I'm saying? It's that kind of thing, right? Nobody would, well, if you're from Terre Haute, I'm sorry, and I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> I see a few sad faces, so I'm sorry. Anyway, um, let's say Lubbock, Texas. Does that make it better for you? Okay. So anyway, the disciples would not 
have thought this was a great place to go. It's, it's so far away, 25 miles, probably a two to three day walk. It's a little bit treacherous. It's the center of the empire uh, and Roman activity and power. It's a place of pagan worship. And in addition to that, it's mostly Gentile. There are very few Jews there at all. So I'm sure the disciples were puzzled as the, the group traveled north and arrived there. And so I want you to think about it. It's in this space, in the shadow of an escarpment of pure rock, 70 feet tall, a beautiful stream running, the headwaters of the Jordan, temples to Pan and to Caesar, the city of Caesarea Philippi with its Roman military installations, and here's where the story begins. Now, when Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Son of Man, human one, Son of God, but really Son of Man is what Jesus is using here in Matthew. He wants to know who they think he is. Remember where we are, right? Who do people say the Son of Man is? And the disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, and some of us think it's one of the other prophets. So it's interesting in that moment the disciples are acknowledging that Jesus does have a special calling and that he's a prophet. They connect him first to his cousin, John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist? Uh, He was Jesus' cousin who Herod had beheaded because he had confronted Herod in divorcing and marrying someone else, and uh, who was his sister-in-law, and it was a big fat mess, and so there was a party, and uh, his niece danced, and he loved it so much, he said, what do you want? And she said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. That's where we get the phrase, I'll have your head on a platter. Did you know that, right? Maybe you never say that. Good for you. And uh, (laughs) so uh, the reality is, some people think maybe John the Baptist is back, that somehow Jesus is channeling. I don't know John the Baptist because they knew one another. The other person is Elijah, one of the greatest prophets from Hebrew Scripture. And we studied Elijah when we did our fail series in January. Remember, he really, uh, uh, I mean, Jeremiah we did, but Elijah was this great prophet who was taken up into heaven and kind of known as the greatest prophet of Israel. And so some people think maybe uh, Jesus is Elijah. And others think maybe he's Jeremiah, who we talked about in the fail series, who confronted the power of the Babylonians and established kind of this continual witness where he suffered. So some think maybe he's all these prophets or someone else, right? That's a good call. But then Jesus says to them, but who do you think I am? Who do you personally think I am? Now, I don't know if you've ever been in class or in a Bible study or at work or in a staff meeting, and a question's asked, and you think you know the answer, but you're not for sure, and so you just sit there hoping somebody else will answer. Anybody, right, right? I think that's the whole environment. At least 11 of the disciples have some sense of what they'd like to say, but they don't say it. But who says it? Peter, Simon Peter. Of course he's going to say it. He's on the edge. He's always ready to go. So Simon Peter says, well, I'll tell you who you are. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now I'm telling you folks, that's a big statement right there. That kind of turns everybody on their ear, right? You are the Christ, Greek, Christos. Uh, It's the Greek word for the word in Hebrew, which means Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one. So immediately, Jesus is more than a prophet, amen? He's the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. Anointed means that we're anointed with oil, right, for the purpose of sacred mission. So kings in Israel were anointed for the work of God. Priests were anointed for the worship of God. Even objects in the temple were anointed for sacred work and sacred purpose. So Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah, and it has all sorts of connotations because people believe that the Christ or the anointed one or the Messiah would deliver them from the Romans. So Peter says, you are the Christ, but then he adds something interesting. You are the Son of God. Now, that would have been connected to all the Davidic lineage that King David and his son Solomon would carry on and be reestablished. But think about location. Caesar was thought to be the Son of God. Do you see what's going on here? There's this complete reversal in the location where they are. And so Jesus is quite impressed with what Simon Peter does, and he replies, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Remember, we knew his father's name. Because no human has shown this truth to you. Rather, my Father who is in heaven has shown you this. And I tell you, and this is where he reaffirms that new nickname, you are Peter. Remember that? 
And remember, Peter comes from the Greek word Petra, which means rock, right? But I want you to be really clear. Petra means a big, fat, huge rock, right? Litho in Greek is the small stone or the small rock or whatever, but Petra is a foundational rock. Think about our location. Where are we? 70-foot rock escarpment right here. Do you see the power of the location? You are Petra. You are Peter. You are a foundational rock, just like this rock is the foundation of Mount Hermon. And I tell you, Peter, that I will build my church. And we take this for granted, too. This is the first place in the Gospel of Matthew where the word ekklesia, the Greek word for church, those called out is what it literally means. It's the first place Jesus uses the word church. It's on this rock that I will build the church. And so people, I'm sure the other 11 are like, are you kidding? Peter's the foundation of the church, right? But remember, Peter represents us too, right? And Peter is seen to be the first bishop of the church and later the first pope of the church and all of those things based on this passage. But it's Petra, this foundational rock, on which the church is built. And then he says these other things. The gates of the underworld will not be able to stand against it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And there are two powerful pieces here. So you remember Pan, right? You remember the Greek god? Well, right there in the cave next to the escarpment, people believed was a portal to the gates of the dead, right? So Jesus is reversing all this in the gate and saying that nothing will prevail against the church, not even the gates of the dead, right? And then he says to Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. And if you see ancient pictures of Peter, he's portrayed holding a group of keys. Well, you're really great today. Here we go, right? So he's holding keys. And, and that comes from the ancient cities. Remember, the cities were walled to protect them, and there were gates, big, heavy, fortified gates. And if you had the key to that gate, you had the key to the city. And so Jesus is saying to Peter, this rock from which the church will be built, both with all of his flaws and all of his faithfulness, that you will have the keys to the kingdom. You will be able to open the kingdom to all kinds of people. And then he goes on to say that anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven, and anything you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. And then he ordered the disciples not to tell anybody he was the Christ. What? So all of this happens in this beautiful setting with this big escarpment of rock, and Peter makes this profound statement, and we're all in tears and go, wow, this is amazing. And then Jesus says, don't tell anybody I'm the Christ. Well, why do you think? Because they're in the city of the emperor, who's supposedly the anointed one. And in fact, people of the day thought that the Messiah would do what? Overthrow the Romans. So if you're in the middle of this Gentile city having a conversation, and they go, oh, this is the Messiah that's going to overthrow Caesar, that's going to be a problem, right? right? <laughs> and so Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Then I wish the story ended here, don't you? powerful. We get a sense of who Jesus is as Lord of our life, as the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. It's a powerful story. We're impressed that Peter has this kind of faithfulness, and it's amazing. But then listen to this next passage. From that time forward, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem. So they're leaving Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee, Galilee, and they had to go to Jerusalem, and that he had to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and then he had to be killed and raised on the third day. So here's this powerful image of Jesus as a Messiah, as the Christ, the anointed, the Son of God, this powerful religious experience, and then Jesus says, now we've got to leave and go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, from the capital of the Gentiles to the capital of the Jews, we have to go to Jerusalem, and, and what's going to happen in Jerusalem? They think Jesus is going to deliver them, amen? But he says, no, that's not what's going to happen at all. I'm going to have to suffer. I'm actually going to have to die. And then on the third day, I'll rise again. And then our dear friend Peter enters the story again. So Petra says, remember he's the foundation of the church, he takes hold of Jesus. According to the Greek, I think he grabs him by the rope collar. You know what I'm saying? He is upset. And he says, God forbid, Lord, this can never happen to you. And in the Greek, it's pretty clear this is not a this can never happen to you. You know what I'm saying? This is yelling and screaming, right? You, this can never happen to you. you think, God forbid that this would happen. And then Jesus turns to Peter. Remember Petra, the rock, the foundation on which the church is going to be built. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Now, I don't know about you, 
I, it's hard to choose somebody to be a leader and then accuse him to be Satan. You know what I'm saying? It's a pretty big extreme, right? I mean, is anybody confused by that? Amen, right? Get behind me, Satan. You are a, listen to this word, stone, letho, that could make, us, that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but you're thinking the thoughts of humans. So Peter suddenly had an image of who Jesus was going to be. And Jesus begins to talk about denial and taking up the cross and suffering and dying for the sake of faith and love and grace. And Peter can't handle it, so he grabs Jesus by the collar and says, this ain't going to happen. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, the adversary. And he says, you are actually not a Petra foundation, but you may possibly be a small stone that would cause me to stumble. It all reflects back to the temptation story earlier in the chapter, right, in the, in the book of Matthew. I don't know about you, but I just find that all fascinating, right? Amazing that this person on which the church will be built can quickly slip and forget what it means to deny self and take up the cross. So the whole purpose of these stories of Peter is that Peter's story is our story, Amen. I don't know about you, but I get on fire for God. I get on fire for Jesus. I'm, I'm ready to do whatever it takes. And then someone says, well, you're going to have to suffer. What? You may have to give this up so that the gospel might be spread. Wait. You may have to not do this anymore and now do this. You may have to deny yourself to let others experience the love and grace of God. And I don't know about you, that's hard for me. Amen? I know you're all saints. You got it down. Amen. But for me... You know, I, I, get, I get challenged. And so then I get what Peter's going through, right? I get this desire to embrace Jesus fully and proclaim this amazing truth, but at the same time to be deeply troubled that if I'm going to follow Jesus, I have to take up the cross, deny myself, and follow him. It may mean the plans I have for me have to change so that I do the plans he has for me. Amen. So I think about this on Mother's Day. I, I mean, what a great text for mothers, amen? Don't you wish you'd gotten this card? Get behind me, Satan, right? You know what I'm saying? I, it, it's, it's fascinating. But I think about women in my life and maybe in your life and certainly in the history of the church and in the history of this church who have lived that truth, amen? Who have in turn followed Jesus and in some ways accepted the shifts and changes and denials and suffering that life brings so that people might have life. Amen? I think about my grandmother, my dad's mom. She grew up with really difficult parents. My great-grandparents were not great. My great-grandfather was a raging alcoholic, and my great-grandmother had all kinds of narcissistic behavior, and so they really didn't raise my grandmother. Her grandparents did, and she raised herself. And you know, it's one of those stories we keep hidden. Anybody got those stories in your family? And, but the reality is, it makes me realize how much my grandmother sacrificed to create the family that then was my family, right? And I remember her saying, don't ever take for granted family and always support your family. And I remember there were times that she would rework and reconcile and connect our family, and I couldn't figure it out. But I realized she knew suffering, right? And in turn, because of that, she worked hard to build this family and to bring grace and love in that. As she taught Sunday school and led at the church and led in our family, it was out of her brokenness, amen, that she was able to live faithfully. I think about uh, women in each of the churches I've served who, who gave of themselves sacrificially and powerfully and boldly so people would come to know Christ or children would be taught or Bible study would be led or the hungry would be fed. I mean, just amazing things. I think about women in this church who were leading and serving and sometimes sacrificing things so that, so that others might experience the love of Jesus. Amen? Some of you are in the room, right? I think about Arlene Messina, who saw a vision for a church in this place and sacrificed a lot to build where we are today. Nancy Robinson, who was part of that, and a host of other women who made that happen. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And so I would say to us today, as we listen to the story of Peter, as we celebrate Mother's Day today, that we think about what is Jesus saying to us? Are we a rock, a Petra, on which the church can be built? Or are we a stone that causes others to stumble? 
Are we willing to release our agenda for the work of Jesus? Or are we too afraid and we say, God forbid, this cannot happen? What kind of rock are we? What kind of rock? As it's Mother's Day, will you join me in this uh, time of prayer? O holy God, who nurtures and cares and creates in our midst, we pray for our mothers who have given us life and love, who've been persistent and courageous, who have been foundational rocks for our lives, that we might show them reverence and love. We pray to the Lord. For mothers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope, that they may lean on you as their rock, and that their family and friends may support and comfort them even this day. We pray to the Lord. For women, though without children of their own, who, like mothers, have nurtured and advocated and cared for us, for these women who've been rocks to us, we pray to the Lord. And God, we pray for mothers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to their children and have not sustained their families. God, we pray for them. Loving God, who in Scripture, like a hen, longs to gather us under your wings, give life and nourishment to all of your children as you watch over this blessed church built on a rock. Bless the women we name in our hearts before you, that they may be strengthened as Christian women and mothers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. May we be foundations to others as others grow in faith. Grant that we, their sons and daughters, may honor these women always as we care for others and share your love in the world. May the example of strong, faithful, foundational women Lead us to be clothed in dignity and honor. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to receive the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So whatever your location, I want you to imagine a sheer rock, a foundational rock of a mountain, and realize that we are called to be part of that foundation. Not stones that cause others to stumble, not stones that are a roadblock to the gospel, but something beautiful and foundational that will share the good news that all are loved and the world can be changed. So go out, you big rock of people, <laughs> and be a foundation on which the church can be built as you are called out to be disciples of Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. amen.